How did IBM, a big mainframe company, create a personal computer? Well, they took a bunch of people here in Boca Raton and asked them to do it. That's how it happened. But come with me back to 1975, when I first started with IBM, and this is what you got if you went to IBM and said, I want to buy a computer. Something that looked like this. Of course, you can sit there and type on it if you wish, but you'd have to buy a few other things in order to flesh out the entire family of products, if you will. And then things like this, excuse me, for mainframes, IBM built everything themselves. This is the inside of the computer. All those parts in there were manufactured by IBM. It wasn't down to the street uh, distributor and buy one. No, they built everything. They controlled it all. Likewise, they wrote all the software themselves. Not easy to get a picture of software, so instead, this is a book about software development written by the man who managed OS 360, Fred Brooks. And OS 360 about cratered the company. One of the things they learned is you can't add more people to a project and make it go faster. The famous quote is, nine women cannot have a baby in one month. <laughs> <laughs> and then this happened. Gordon Moore had predicted that transistor counts would continue to double every year, year and a half, something like that, and it became feasible for a hobbyist to purchase a computer for $400 and have their own computer at home. IBM not too worried about this, but is still following that path. So IBM's first personal computer, perhaps, is the IBM 5100. It was done in Rochester, Minnesota. A simple box like this, it would cost you a minimum of $9,000 in 1975 to own it, but it would get the job done, but hardly a personal computer. And in the true IBM fashion, all the parts inside are built by IBM, from stem to stern, if you will. Also, all the software is done by IBM, in fact, it reuses some of the software from the System 360 in order to simplify the task, if you will. So IBM still feels comfortable. But then two guys in Silicon Valley named Steve, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, come up with the Apple II. And this is not a hobbyist computer like the MITS Altair. This is an appliance computer. You take it out of the box, you set it on the table, you plug it into the wall, and it works. You don't have to know which end of the soldering iron gets warm in order to use this machine. <laughs> and even worse, if you're an IBM salesman, these begin showing up in IBM accounts. Yeah, they've got a System 360 running the books, but in a couple of offices or laboratories, you begin to see these personal computers. Uh, maybe we should do something about it. Well. That's where I get involved. February of 1978, I went to work on what became the System 23 Data Master at Building 203. Now, you know, you've probably heard that personal computers were originally built by five guys in a garage. Well, this was IBM's simulation of that. This is the door I went in, so 50 guys working in a building that looked like this, that was as close as IBM was gonna be able to get. And we needed to do something different. Needed to mix it up a little bit. And so we went to these guys. Uh, these are the three founders of Intel. Gordon Moore of the famous law is the one on the right. And we bought their microprocessor, the Intel 8085, to use inside the machine. And this is the first time that IBM had ever used somebody else's processor for any of their products. This was a big step for IBM, but we weren't willing to go all the way. We only bought the hardware from somebody else. The software we wrote ourselves, a basic interpreter, a simple operating system, and that turned out to be the problem. It took us an awful long time to do that. So the System 23 Data Master did come out, 
Unfortunately, it wasn't until July of 1981, three and a half years from the time we started, primarily due to doing our own software. You can see at least we got to the point where we use somebody else's hardware, but it was pretty obvious by 1980, we were going too slow. This was taking too long. We need to rethink the way we're doing everything. So task force, and then finally a development group is put in place. And so September of 1980, we went out and visited these two guys out in Bellevue, Washington, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, because we're gonna buy software from somebody else. Got the hardware from Intel, we'll get the software from Microsoft. So we put these components together. And August 12th, 1981, we announced the IBM personal computer. So, thank you. It was the combination of somebody else's hardware and somebody else's software that allowed us to do it in less than a year from the time we first started until we were able to announce the product. But there was more than just that. Here's the system board, just to show you that everything is but built by somebody else. And in fact, that big clunky keyboard on the original PC was the only part that was manufactured from components by IBM. Everything else we bought from somebody else. By the way, the component in the dead middle of that uh, thing, that was the part I built, but that's <laughs> no big deal. But I always like to point that out because that's what I did. Here's the software. We got that from Microsoft along with the basic interpreter that was built in there. But we needed more. We needed applications to run on the system. You know, otherwise, it's just an expensive paperweight sitting there. So we went to a company that made VisiCalc, the very first spreadsheet program. As you would expect, got to have a spreadsheet, the first killer application. Need that for your personal computer. But here's the relationship that we developed in 1980 that doesn't quite make sense. We needed a word processing program. The best of breed in the market is Easy Writer. The author of Easy Writer is John Draper, this guy. Can you imagine IBM doing business with a guy that looked like that in 1980? We did. By the way, John was also known as a phone freaker the people who would steal long distance telephone calls. And he got his name, Captain Crunch, his gnome de guerre, if you will, because he was the guy who discovered that if you took the toy whistle in a box of Captain Crunch cereal, dialed a long distance phone call, artfully blew into the whistle, you could make that call for free. So that's one of the foundations of the IBM personal computer right there. Another thing, somewhat controversial, is that unlike IBM had ever done before, we published everything for the world to see in the technical reference manual. We published the schematic diagrams of our system. We published the listings for the BIOS, the part that I wrote for the PC. Not so that clones could copy it and make their own versions of the IBM PC, but to invite the rest of the industry to participate with our machine, to write programs, to build hardware for it. Many people might say that that was a mistake. We shouldn't have done that. But my counter argument can best be expressed with this magazine. PC Magazine first appeared about six months after the IBM PC had been announced and it appears as about 100 pages, and they publish it monthly. Within three years, PC Magazine was publishing over 1,000 pages monthly, and the reason they had to publish that much is to include all the advertisements for the hardware and software that worked with the IBM PC. Our attempt to bring other people into the fold, to get them to build stuff for our machine was clearly successful. We had to do something even more radical for the IBM company. IBM was built on the strength of their salesmen, 
blue-suited, wing-tipped IBM salesman would come to your door and sell you a 360. Not going to work for personal computers. So we have to get sales, retail sales involved in this. Now, this isn't the company we ended up going with. This was their original name, but as you might guess, Radio Shack had a problem with it. So a week later, they are called Computer Land. But this was the retail store that we went to, along with Sears Business Centers, so that you could go buy an IBM personal computer without having to deal with an IBM salesman. It could be a personal experience buying the machine, if you wished. Another thing, I don't have time to show you the commercials, but if you just go to YouTube and search a little bit, you can find the original IBM Charlie Chaplin commercials trying to sell you the IBM PC. That was the first instance of IBM creating commercials that ran on television to sell to retail customers. Charlie Chaplin, the little tramp, selling you a tool for modern times. That was the way that the marketing people got engaged in changing everything in the business also. So I don't know whether your business or your activity or whatever will uh, benefit from rethinking every relationship you have from the way you do business, from the way you develop your products to the way you sell them but in the case of the IBM PC, developed right here in Boca Raton, it certainly worked for us. We were able to take a big company that builds mainframes and teach it how to tap dance. Thank you.